Hi, welcome to Fictional Narrative. I'm Mary, and today I'm going to be wrapping up my month of March. I haven't uploaded in a little bit, but I have been reading all the while. I did not make my goal last year, which was about like 70 something books. So this year I set it to 35. And in the month of March, I've gone through a lot of audiobooks. I think I'm starting, I'm starting to like more of the detective stories in the mystery genre. It's, it's definitely kind of easier to follow one detective. And I've been listening to a lot of Agatha Christie's books in the Hercule Poirot series. I really, really love his character. Now the standard of writing then and now are not the same, but I'm looking for a good mystery setup. So the books that I read aren't in order. They're kind of just coming up as Libby has them available for me to listen to. But like most mystery series, you can read them as standalones. So the first one I did in March was Murder on the Links. I rated that one a 4 out of 5. And then Murder on the Orient Express, which is also a 4 out of 5. Peril at End House was also a 4 out of 5. Um, Murder in Mesopotamia was a 3 out of 5. Uh, Mystery on the Blue Train was a 3 out of 5 for me. And then The Big Four was a 1 out of 5. I don't have too much to say on most of these books just because I'm going through them really quickly. I do have a highlight reel on my Instagram where I do quick reviews. I usually don't go over three sentences in those reviews, but if you want a short review of these books, you can definitely head over there. My Instagram is in the description box. So back to the big four. It was like an effort to give Hercule Poirot this like big bad villain or corp not corporation, but like organization, that's his villain, that he has to take down all of these people in the organization. And the execution, mm -mm -mm. it was it was really, really bad. Uh, and honestly, I think it portrays the main characters of the series, Hastings and Poro. At one, po at one point, Poro has a smoke bomb. It's just really weird to me that a character who puts so much emphasis on not really running around but using his brain to solve mysteries would then just let me use a bomb. So that's six books right there and those were all by Agatha Christie. And now I'm going to move on to a book I actually have the physical copy of and that is On What Grounds by Cleo Coyle. I rated this a 4 out of 5, and this is the first in a series. It follows the character Clara Cosi as she takes over management of a coffee house she used to work at. The first day that she's trying to move into the apartment above the coffee house, she finds her assistant manager dead. And so now she has to solve that mystery. I loved it. I love the twist ending. I love the setup of the mystery. I love Claire's character. It is just book one and we're introduced already to a love triangle. When I know that something is a series, I really enjoy more of a slow burn, but it's not like anything's official yet, which I can appreciate. But the reason this is a four out of five for me is one of the romances is just a little too forced. Love interests are always going to be attractive in these stories, but it's like real life rules. Just because somebody's hot doesn't mean you want them to act like they know they're hot because it's just like this long ego stroke. And for him, it kind of manifests in, you know, interfering with her sleuthing a bit. And I liked it when she kind of did it by herself. So four out of five for me, but I will continue with the series because it is good. And I am already rooting for one of the love interests. It's just not the one that knows he's hot. The next book I read is The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow. I got this one on Audible. I was kind of deciding between getting the physical copy and I'm so glad that I got the audiobook instead because the narration is amazing. The narrator did an amazing, amazing job. I rated this book a 3 out of 5. It's about three sisters who come together in New Salem. The year that this takes place in is 1893. The suffrage movement is, you know, starting to pick up traction. New Salem is trying to 
move away from its history of persecuting wishes, but the sentiment and the attitude of it still hasn't gone away and it's surfacing more with suffrage. One of the sisters, Juniper, is trying to also revive witchcraft. So there's a lot of tension going on here. When I first read the synopsis, I think this book reminded me of The Witches of New York, which I also enjoyed. I found it really weird that there was like a dis so many descriptions of smiling in the dark. It feels like the characters are like physically in the dark quite often. There are so many of those descriptions. I like teeth as much as the next person. I don't need to read so many descriptions of them smiling in the dark. It really kind of took me out of the book. But the biggest thing about it was the villain felt like, how are you going to defeat this villain? And it kind of disappointed me in the, in the end. It really didn't go out with a bang. Continuing with Audible, the next book is Ink and Shadows by Ellery Adams. This one I rated a 5 out of 5. I don't know if I've rated any book in this series, The Secret Book and Scone Society, anything less than a 5. This is the fourth installment in the series. It follows Nora Pennington, the owner of Miracle Books, and her friends who become acquainted with a mother and daughter duo that moves into the town for a fresh start. Every single book in this series will hit you in the feels. And this mystery was so exciting and to see the characters figure it out and try to navigate and see who's really pulling the strings was incredible. The next book is also an audible read. It's called A Case of Cat and Mouse by Sophie Kelly. I've been following this series for a while and originally I read this book in December, but there was a lot going on and I just could not remember what happened when I thought about it. So I reread it in the month. <laughs> so I reread it in the month of March. The series follows a librarian named Kathleen Paulson, and in this book, we find that she's also taken on a part-time job as a researcher for a reality TV show that's come to town. It is a baking show, and when she comes into work one day, she finds one of the judges dead. I rated this one a 4 out of 5. Usually, I am knocked out of the park by books in this series, but... I found that I didn't like how little sleuthing there was. You have your kind of cast of suspects, which are the contestants in this reality show, and they come to Kathleen and they tell her their side of the story, which tends to be what happens in cozy mysteries. I don't have any issue with that, but the way that it's portrayed in this specific book made it come, come off like it was a little therapy session for them. and. Also, to add context, Kathleen's boyfriend is the detective who is working on the case, so it's almost like they would go to her and they would tell their side of the story and see if it was clear to tell her boyfriend. Like, why wouldn't you just tell the detective if you thought the detective was suspicious but you're willing to tell his girlfriend? Like, I know a lot of people say that cozy mysteries, like they don't give you a lot of action. This series will give you action. This series and the Secret Book and Scone Society, any books in that series, kind of scares the cozy out of cozy mystery, just adds a little bit of thriller in it, but they do it well. So the next book is If Books Could Kill by Kate Carlisle. This one I read as an ebook, which I borrowed from Libby. I read the first one of the series. This is the second. I wrote I read the first one in October, and that one knocked me off my feet. I love the concept of this main character not being, you know, tied down to a small town. She's traveling. She has a reputation career-wise. Her name is Brooklyn Wainwright. She is a bookbinder, which is an interesting career to pursue, and we see different portions of that world, which kind of kept me on my toes. The start of the mystery has to do with books. And in this case, Brooklyn goes to the Edinburgh Book Fair and she bumps into her ex, who 
I mean, has been looking for her. He asks her to authenticate a book that could embarrass the monarchy. And then he turns up dead. In comparison to the first book, I found this one underwhelming. I rated it a 2 out of 5. It seemed like a fish out of water, in a sense. Brooklyn was consistently misogynistic to the women around her, which doesn't happen, really, in the first book. And she's surrounded by incredible female characters who are strong, who she admires, so it seemed very, very out of character. I still do like the concept, so I'm gonna read the third book to see whether or not I want to continue with the series. I don't think I can really enjoy it if there is continual misogyny that doesn't really have any place, doesn't really serve any purpose. Okay, second to last book, and I do have the physical copy of this book. It is in summations by Zadie Smith. I loved this. This was a 5 out of 5 for me. So I picked up this book because I'm starting to get into reading a lot of nonfiction essays. This is a series of essays in which Zadie Smith tells us about her experience at the start of lockdown. So it is incredibly beautifully written. Um, in the foreword, she also mentions that she finished Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. There is a part in the beginning, or in the book that I have, it's a part in the beginning, that is Debts and Lessons, and she has Debts and Lessons at the end of the book. And yes, it does feel very intimate. I think that her observations and the way that she tells the stories and describes people as everything is going into lockdown is so incredibly powerful and beautiful and it is a very small book. It is a very, very small book. It's very, very tiny, but it is very powerful. And finally, we have The House on the Vesper Sands. I was in Barnes & Noble and I saw this book and it looked pretty big and I opened it and it tells me it takes place in London in 1893. So for sure, I was like, I need to get the audiobook version because the narrator is probably going to have an accent and it's going to be really cool. So as I said, it takes place in London in 1893 and it follows Inspector Cutter, Gideon Bliss, and Octavia Hillingdon as they try to f understand this mystery that follows a series of disappearing girls. I really, really, really wanted to like this book. I rated it a 3 out of 5 for Goodreads purposes. It is really a 2.5 out of 5. I liked the chemistry between Inspector Cutter and Gideon Bliss. They have a mentor-mentee type of relationship. But Octavia really rubbed me in the wrong way in her introduction. I think you could tell that the author was going for a strong woman kind of introduction he ended up making her more like a Karen. She's a reporter for a newspaper, but in the actual investigation of the mystery, she doesn't really do too much. I still don't know what the house on the Vesper Sands is. I know that it made an appearance. It's definitely written as if there's going to be a sequel that will explain more of the supernatural part or something, but given the information that I have and how disappointing it was to go through this book. I'm not really interested in the second one. So, um, 2.5 it is. So with the magic of audiobooks, I read 13 books in the month of March. Whew, I don't think any other month in this year will be this packed. So, so if you want to see what I'm up to, my socials are in the description. I'm mostly active on Instagram, where I also do my quick reviews. Let me know if any of the titles in this video interest you, or if you disagree with me on anything, you might actually know what's going on with the house on the Vesper Sands. I still don't. Bye!